Matt mentioned in the introduction, the environmental humanities, one of the aspects that it's concerned with is trying to find an inclusive way of looking at people and nature. Um, and I suppose that's kind of where we're kind of coming from. And actually trying to look at paleoecology looks at um, nature, in theory, um, and the humanities look at that human aspect. So we're just trying to have a little bit of an exploration around how these two things go together and can paleoecology contribute towards the environmental humanities, in particular looking at um, eco-criticism as a form within the environmental humanities. But also, given that there are these different crossovers between archaeology, paleoecology, the environmental humanities and eco-criticism, um, a lot of what the environmental humanities is about is about trying to bring these different narratives together to try and look at how they do intersect with one another. So I'm going to kind of leave it at that at the moment. Uh, we're going to go through and look at what is paleoecology, what is eco-criticism, just to give a little bit more of a background on both of those. Uh, then we're going to sketch out how we think that we might try to merge the two into a kind of eco-critical paleoecology. Um, some contributions uh, to eco-critical thought. Well, well. I've just noticed yeah. that. Yeah, they've all turned into number one. So we're going to do all of these at the same time in the first bit. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then also look at um, eco-critical perspectives on and of paleoecology. This will all become clear as we go along. Uh, and then wrap up with a few conclusions. So we do have some paleoecologists in the room. But um, generally, paleoecology is about trying to look at past ecosystems and environments. And the ways in which we generally tend to do this is through looking at some of these small things, like bits of pollen and bits of insects. Um, but sometimes within this, we also start to get some of the macro fossils coming through, where we start to merge potentially more into environmental archaeology with some of the more kind of wood fragments, leaf fragments, seeds, nuts, etc. And this is also completely ignoring animals in this and parasites, but we'll come to that at another point. Um, but today, really, what we're going to be looking at is uh, pollen within the context of paleoecology. So I'll hand over to Ben. With actually a, a bit of archaeology as well, actually, one of our examples. Oh, that's true. Um, yeah, well. yeah. so, so really, I, probably just a quick show of hands. Who's familiar with eco-criticism just as a, as a kind of concept, as an idea? Anyone at all in the room? A few people? Yeah. Who's not at all? Okay, just so I have a, have a, fee, have a feeling for it. Obviously, kind of within a session like this, we can't really go into huge depth um, behind this concept. So really, this is kind of to give you a bit of a flavour for what comes next in the paper terms of exactly what is eco-criticism. Um, it kind of sometimes go under, uh, goes under different names, and names you may have heard under include green cultural studies, eco-poetics, it kind of sometimes has connections with, with deep ecology. Um, all these terms are contested in one way or another as well. Eco-criticism as a term is the one that's kind of, kind of stuck. Um, I'm going to return shortly to kind of give you a very, very brief kind of uh, timeline on this, but if we were to define it um, we can begin with this definition, uh, which is Cheryl uh, Glott-Feltley's definition, 96, uh, to study the relationship between literature and the physical environment, which is kind of how E.K. Christensen became very, began very much concerned with, with the written word, if, if you like. Um, again, another quite useful quote, I mean, what, what is going on here? Really, it's just the, this idea of tracking environmental ideas and rep representations wherever they appear, whatever format they, they come in. So it is moving towards kind of outside the kind of realm of literature into other kind of forms of cultural expression, if you will. And this quote by uh, Heiss or Heiser more recently um, refers to a triple allegiance, the scientific study of nature, the scholarly analysis of cultural representations and the political struggle for more sustainable ways of inhabiting the natural world. So we're seeing kind of different themes uh, coming together there, if you like. So I suppose we'd kind of um, I suppose um, isolate kind of three ideas for the rest of this the rest of the paper I suppose and these are just kind of three we focused on there are many other kind of ideas kind of uh, playing around in here uh, and briefly we could kind of frame it like this uh, cultural production structures and governs the interaction between humans and the natural environment whatever that is and that within eco-criticism is a big is a big question a big problem about how we talk to talk about and refer to nature and the natural environment and kind of the way that is structured by cultural production and the way in turn that kind of is a kind of a, is a spiral um, and particularly underlying this is the idea that we need to think about these uh, issues in a problematic way because they of central importance to the current ecological crisis or crises that kind of confront us so it's that kind of um, that, that kind of idea um, something else that, that is being more and more discussed uh, in, in recent times and this is Greg uh, Gerard's recently made this point 
that underlying a lot of this is, is, is the fact that ecocriticism often looks to draw what Gerard refers to as a certain moral authority from science, which in, in, and of itself is perhaps problematic, and that's something we can maybe return to. And thirdly, and this is a kind of important bit, is that for most eco-critics, um, what is the point behind all this is and that is the, f- the fact that we need to be more active and engaged when it comes to, to, to uh, ecological problems um, and potential solutions. So those kind of three strands that are kind of, uh, are kind of going on here. So they're just the three we're kind of picking up on. There are, there are many others. And again, really, if you, t- if you kind of look at the field... A lot of people trace ecocriticism back to 1962 in this book by um, Rachel Carson, Silent Spring, some of you may be familiar with. Um, and really, uh, this is kind of in many ways seen as kind of seminal text, but it's not probably... 1978 is often given as the, as the year that ecocriticism appears as an actual expression. Um, that's uh, William Ruckert, I think, coined it. But then it ke- seemed to lie dormant really until the 90s. And after that, you kind of get, it starts to gather pace and you get a ex- bit of an explosion it increases three times, particularly you've got names like people like Lawrence Buell, The Environmental Imagination, very important text. And through times, through time, as, as I said, this kind of field opens up. So now we see, for example, post-colonial ecocriticism, feminist ecocriticism, material ecocriticism, and so forth. So you can kind of see there how we're kind of getting these, the field sort of opening up, and particularly this, this, this idea that we're talking about a field of thought that's very much intersectional, multiple entry points. Excuse me. Um, in particular, these intersections uh, between literature, the sciences, um, the different schools of thought, post humanism's in there, eco feminism's in there, film studies, animal studies, kind of almost you name it, and there's kind of, um, uh, there's kind of these interfaces with eco criticism. So, as I said, you know, mainly focused in the early days on literature, but in kind of opening up into the visual arts and expanding very much in more recent times to include environmental history, sociology so forth, many, you know, many other areas of engagement. And I suppose that's kind of, kind of our, our entry point, if you will. Um, and, our kind of, uh, our, and again, this is kind of a recent project. This is something we've not been thinking about that long. And again, hopefully, um, you know, what we're going to talk about today, hopefully we'll have some feedback on some of this. Um, you may, some of you may disagree with some of this. As I say, there's one or two paleoecologists in the room. Some of this they, um, you know, may, may seem unusual. And um, that's good. Hopefully we'll get some discussion going. So there's two kind of strands we're going to talk about in the rest of the paper, and that is A and A. Again, A and A, and then what's happening? This is what happens when you prepare a presentation on a Mac, then go to a PC. Anyway, so I should say A and B. Um, so we've got the first theme is the contribution that eco-critical work, sorry, that paleontological work and thought might make to eco-criticism and the environmental humanities. Matt's already talked about this um, in his first paper, so it's kind of related to that strand. We're not going to talk about that so much, actually. We're going to talk a little bit more about the second part of this, point B, um, which, which are what we would suggest will be eco-critical perspectives on and of paleoecology. So very much turning an eco-critical lens on paleoecology, what we do as paleoecologists, and again, coming back to some, some of these ideas about ways that we construct ideas of the environment. Okay, so that's, that's kind of two strands going on there. So again, the kind of first point of this is, um, as we said, Matt's talked about this, and there are many kind of uh, many kind of um, suggestions you might make here. This is just one kind of we're floating up to start with. Um, an important foundational book within eco criticism is this book by Max Oliver Schlager, The Idea of Wilderness, it's published in 1991. Um, again, very important in many ways because it, it critiques the idea of wilderness and particularly how the idea of wilderness in the wild has changed through time. But it's got what we, we refer to now as a very kind of naive idea about uh, particularly the Mesolithic Neolithic transition and the idea that somehow that prehistoric people, again this is his quote, existed in an Eden-like condition of hunter-gathering you know, prior to uh, the, uh, the Neolithic and the kind of change that comes, comes with that that he thinks is related to kind of shifting ideas of wilderness and so forth. And whilst that is, that, that some of this work has been criticised, it's interesting that, that quite recently, um, well, I'm saying recent, it's 2004, actually, it's not that recent, um, but again, it makes its way, some of these ideas from Olish Lager make, make their way into books like Greg Gerrard's um, Eco Criticism Introduction recently. So there's all sorts of things we can, we could, ways we could go here, in particular, again, as Matt said, looking at ideas in recent times, you know, we're much more critical of the idea that the Mesolithic people in particular are impacting on the environment, they're probably burning vegetation deliberately. So these ideas somehow that people 
prior to the Neolithic, Neolithic are not impacting on the environment and not having direct environmental impacts, kind of gone out the window. So that's one strand for us. We can maybe think of ways of using our data directly to feed into some of these ideas to do with wilderness and the wild and these kind of concepts that are much discussed within eco-criticism. And something else I've been kind of, um, another project I've been involved with is, again, related to this, um, and that is more looking at the way uh, the environment is represented in different forms of literature, and again, this is based in Ireland, and this in particular is looking at the work of Seamus Heaney, his bog poems, kind of the ideas of peatlands that come through within in Heaney, these very kind of strong ideas to do with kind of peatlands as being kind of eternal, the wet centuries, bottomless, for example, um, bogland poem in Death of Naturalist. You know, and this is just not the case. You know, Irish peatlands, are, the, the commercial peatlands, are heavily exploited for, um, for their peat. And they're kind of their industrial landscapes. And kind of somehow the idea that um, these ideas of kind of, of, of nature and peatlands that are kind of transmitted through Heaney. And a lot of, kind of, a lot of people will kind of take almost, I mean, it's very difficult to criticise Heaney in Ireland, you know, kind of for, for good reasons. Um, so something we've been looking at is maybe ways that there's a kind of, a fracture between the idea that peatlands, the idea of peatlands that Heaney presents, and actually the kind of reality in terms of the extraction of peat, and part of this is, is the destruction of archaeology. So, for example, there's around about 4,000 archaeological sites in, in the industrial extracted peatlands of, of the Midlands of Ireland. 4,000 archaeological sites, none of which will be preserved in situ. So we have a real contrast between some representations of peatlands within kind of literature such as Heaney and the actual reality, and also the impact not only on peatlands as ecosystems, but also on the archaeological records. So we've got kind of all those kind of themes going on there. Okay, let's speed up a bit. Um, just going to hand you briefly over to Susan. Okay, so to come to B, which actually says B, um, an outline of uh, eco-critical perspectives on effectively kind of our data, our approaches, and of paleoecology, um, the praxis of it. So there's five things that I think we're going to run through. Uh, one is how are specific ideas and representations of past ecosystems and their relationship to humans and non-human actors created and sustained through paleoecology. Uh, we have actually got some others, but we're going to focus on ooh, look, um, uh, two of them. So I'm just going to highlight those. Um, and then the bottom one as well, looking at how we can look at flattening knowledge structures. And this, again, is something that uh, Matt referred to. Oh, no, actually, so you referred to in your introduction, was this idea that we privilege science. So how can we potentially start to look at some ways where we're bringing in other perspectives, other narratives, um, really not to kind of challenge science, but as just other voices in there alongside it. Uh, the other ones we can come back to later. Okay, so... Um so yeah, the first one. Um, so yeah, how are specific ideas and representations of past ecosystems and relationships to human and non-human actors created through paleoecological research? So I mean, uh, at the end of the day, and this is again an important theme within eco-criticism, is, is, is how is the um, natural environment represented? How do we understand it? Um, and again, this is I think particularly relevant to paleoecology because at the end of the day, you know, we can create. Um, we can create virtual reality reconstructions of past environments, such as this one down here, the Temple Woodstone Circle in Scotland with its vegetation, based partly on paleoecological data. And we might produce paintings that, again, such as this kind of, uh, kind of slightly idyllic Neolithic landscape with people hunter-gathering. And more sophisticated methods we now have in paleoecology, modelling landscapes in more quantitative ways. So there's different ways of kind of projecting our environment, paleoenvironmental reconstructions um, and this relates very much to a kind of quite a hot debate in eco-criticism between what's sometimes referred to as realist and constructivist approaches. So particularly questions about how our perception of the environment is culturally shaped and how that perception is mediated through language. Okay. So the most obvious point here, I suppose, and again this is very kind of hotly debated, um, in particular at the kind of one end of this you have this, this kind of belief that nature is essentially discursive construction and the reality of it only comes from the way we write, speak and think about it. Okay, now I'm not going to go into that in terms of the way we understand nature in the present day, but pale environments are entirely discursive constructions. We can have as many paintings or quantitative reconstructions as we like, but they only exist up here. We can go out, we can walk into the, the, the forest and the woodland around Southampton and we can talk about how we understand nature and how that relates to how we write about nature. But when it comes to paleo, paleoecology, we only have discursive constructions of one form or another. So they're entirely discursive constructions. And related to that, there's all sorts of ways we could go with that. We can maybe come back to it. 
It relates to that in part is the fact that often in paleoecology, when we have, oh my God, it's a pollen diagram. Um, sorry about that. You don't need to look at it in detail, but this is kind of illustrating the point. You know, this pollen diagram is no more a past environment um, than one of those paintings is. This is a, it's a data set that we interpret. Okay, so pale environments are kind of project, they're mental projections in many ways, and that comes with a number of problems when, we, when we're trying to, not only when we write about our data, but when we're trying to kind of uh, communicate with um, other interest groups, if you will. Okay, let's not worry about that now. Susan. So to come to the, um, the fifth point, uh, looking at these kind of ideas of flattening knowledge structures, I'm going to quickly run through um, an example where within the pollen diagram that Ben just showed, uh, traditionally we would always plot our pollen taxa um, by a kind of Linnaean taxonomy system, a little bit like what Matt was saying, he was <laughs> making the point of using Latin names and common names, and it may sound like a very obvious point, but um, people didn't perceive uh, Latin names in the past. Um, this is something that we use to order our data. It's very much our perspective. So if we are trying to get to perspectives in the past, <coughs> are there different ways that we can start to think about different ways of representing this data? So uh, I'll show you a pollen diagram in a second, but um, this is a, a historic example of a coppice woodland, and you can just see at the bottom here it says, with good birch, ash, and other poles. The point here is the poles. They're getting, they're getting wood out, it doesn't matter to a certain extent what the species is. They've said um, common names, not Latin names. So we've got these different perspectives. We've got oral history, we've got um, historic documents for this woodland, and we've got a pollen record. And how do we actually start to um, integrate these and mesh them together? So the way in which we've just started to kind of play with this is actually think, well, we've got these curves. We can actually call them different things. We can lump them together. We don't have to plot them out as just, here's the, here's the Quercus curve, here's the Corollus curve. We can actually go, okay, here's the pole curve. These are the poles that were coming out, or the pollen from the trees that are likely to be the poles. There's lots of issues with this, but it's just a way of trying to put it out there that there's different ways that we can think about it and different ways that we can bring different perspectives in. So our conclusions really are, this is just a, a, us trying to think about different ways in which we can start to play with some of these ideas, make paleoecology relevant to other disciplines, whether that's eco-criticism, whether that's history, whether that's oral history, whether that's a different audience, whether that's the public, whether that's a different sector. Uh, and just thinking about how we go about creating that data to start with has to be a first point. And I'll leave it there because I think we're over time. Thank you.